And hello, everyone. Welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 277. <gasps> There's Edward St. Ange and Stewie showing up. And Adele was here, but then she was having technical issues. And microphone, camera, microphone, camera, microphone. Technology's great when it works, isn't it? There she is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, I apologize in advance. <laughs> no, you're great that you're here. It doesn't make any difference when you make the entrance. Dun, 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 dun. And there's wow. Stewie. <laughs> Golly, Dang. here from women. I was thinking I was going to just do the solo. Ah, well, Black Friday. And the next thing you know. <laughs> well, we, we didn't like the tears that you shared last episode. You know, we, we or the begging? The Did, was, it, was there begging? I had begging, too. I think I threw begging in there. After the holidays. So. Oh, yeah, I, I, and I did the whole martyr thing, like, oh, oh, oh please. <laughs> <laughs> well, and thank the, you. The I'm glad is, it worked. The truth is, if we if we show up today on, on Black Friday, then we don't have to show up on Christmas Day. The rest of the guys have to do that shift. That's so. right. There you go. That's right. We traded, we traded them, it right? out. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, yeah, I just realized I didn't put gel in my hair today, so eventually my hair's going to go turn into this. I'm going to turn into this long-haired beatnik here real soon as it dries out from the shower. Nice. Next thing I'll be like, yo, dude. <laughs> so happy Friday, Black Friday, everybody. Happy nice Black Friday. Friday. Thanksgiving. It, it is going to be kind Stuart, of fun. Although- Stuart, did you uh, end up going um, in line Wednesday <laughs> afternoon to wait for a PS5? <laughs> no, man. No, no. I, I am a Nintendo fanboy through and through. That would be like cheating on my wife. <laughs> so, so I have a totally non-hospitality marketing question, more of a Black Friday purchase question. Surprise! I know, right? But why change the model? model? Um, um, so this news SD card for the, they actually say that they're for the Switch. It's like mm-hmm. 256K. Mm-hmm. Is that unique just to the Switch? 256 gig, I would assume, not K. Okay, 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 yeah. No, 256 gig, it's really small. Yeah, no, um, it just has a Mario or a, or a Link icon on it, but it, it's well, and just it, regular. Well, it, it's really, speed. it's a high-speed uh, memory. So, I mean, you yeah, can no, get one that meant one for ones, yeah. really good, like, DSLRs. They're the same thing. Yeah, any any uh, micro SD will work in it. So yeah, you uh, don't, okay. don't I didn't know Nintendo it was one, you the Nintendo tax on it. But yeah, having, exactly. Yeah. So I convinced one of my friends to pick a uh, Oculus. Go what? figure. How? Oh, like friends. you barely, you barely talk about it. <laughs> I know, I hardly <laughs> ever, right? And, and so I go over and I go to because his wife wants to buy for him as a Christmas present. So I'm like, sure. She says, can you just get it for me? And I'm like, sure. I go sold out. The, the 64 gig ones, the the, oh, the smaller yeah, yeah. version, they're gone. So I got to go back and talk to her today. It's like, yeah, hey, an extra hundred bucks <laughs> uh, yeah. for an extra hundred. Uh, you know, you can get the much larger one, which I already have. But yeah, so now just uh, can you put an SD card in it to expand no. it from sixty four? You can't. Nope, no, that's one of the big flaws. Mm. I don't know if it's a flaw. I think it's a because I had the same question about why they don't have the the processor separate from the goggles, make the goggles thinner and lighter. Like, why not? Why do you have to put the computer in the headset? And I guess it's just because that way it's a little bit more efficient in processing to the. Well, and that way you have to upgrade every year that they come out with new ones. I mean, they're playing the yeah. Apple MO. Oh, hello, Apple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although I am very happy with my my 12 Pro. I, I got to tell you, the pictures, the LiDAR radar is exceptionally very cool. We're the cool part is the LiDAR radar because it, it comes up every episode now. What's that? LIDAR. Oh, LIDAR. LIDAR. Yeah, the Lord. keyword is LIDAR. <laughs> I, took an, I took an upgrade on my Samsung 9S Plus, whatever it is. Oh, gosh. I'm having that. No, you're fine. You're fine. Are you still hearing the echo? I am. Yeah. I can hear a little bit. I can hear now it my too. phone won't work. My husband just spent an hour and a half on the phone with uh, AT&T. No luck. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to buy a new device after spending, you know, a thousand dollars or more and only having it for two years. It just makes me cry. Uh, yeah. That's a shame. Yeah, no. Which is, which is funny how intelligent the marketing has gotten on phones, because if you think about it, they've got a lot of people spending over a thousand dollars a year 
when you consider most people like death grip their laptops for you know five six years and are just annoyed if they have to buy another laptop for seven eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars right like same price as a phone yet people like many people every year are like new phone time let's go yeah. new phone yeah we're a little more attached to our phone than our laptop i mean we literally take sure. it to the party and to the bed with us you know so it's you do Stuart, I don't really want to know the rest of the story here. <laughs> I cannot sleep without an audible book going on. I, really? I, I have a little speaker under my pillowcase. Oh, by the way, Adele, congratulations. You are now on iTunes and Amazon wow. and on Spotify. And yeah, you're, you're, there's only Deezer and um, Google, uh, Stitcher, Stitcher are still the last two that I haven't propagated on your, your podcast. I haven't even heard of oh, these. Oh, wow, ones. how exciting. Yeah. Yes, you have. Don't, yeah, you have. Stitcher. <laughs> Stitcher. <laughs> is that, is that for cross-stitching well, podcasts? Stuart knows what Stitcher yeah, is. Stitch is one of the big original four. Like, oh, okay. Places. It's not one of those weird ones that Lauren does that, that no one listens to. Him. <laughs> I have you know that it's very profitable to be on the Filipino podcast network just so i'm saying <laughs> actually filipino is one of the languages that put the podcast in i it do is. actually get a lot of people out of the philippines to listen to the podcast yeah I don't know I look at that podcast um geography breakdown a lot we get we get a handful out of philippines as well uh, yeah it really is it's fun to watch and and adele i think i sent you an invite to the platform podcast.co so you can go into your podcast and of course we gotta jazz up your your podcast page a little bit but uh, you can go in there and add stuff and what have you. But you can also look at the analytics as to the countries and what platforms open it and stuff. Um, so are you getting a lot of people from Amazon listening to your podcast where they do the, hey, uh, Alexa? No? Uh, no. I mean, it works on that, but I don't, I don't yeah, think it's because a no one, Because no one, no one does that. A lot of people many, do that. <laughs> no one's like, hey, Alexa, I want to listen to something that everyone else in my house also has to listen to. Not necessarily. <laughs> Each little Alexa can be its own little thing. You don't have to podcast it everything. <laughs> I've got one on my side of the bed, and my husband has his own. See? See? <laughs> Although I did drive my wife crazy today, yesterday, actually. I installed uh, the new wireless uh, light bulbs in my kitchen, so I can just tell Google to turn on the light bulbs. She says, why'd you do this? It's because I can. <laughs> you know what's cheaper than doing that? Yeah, it's just, just leave buying, the light switch Buying the smart light switch and just swapping it out. Yeah, I know. So that way well, you're, not paying, tax. Tax. The light you're not paying a tax. tax every time you have to change that light bulb. The light bulbs will last for 25,000 hours. And besides no, that, it's way cooler that I can tell each light bulb to change colors. Mm -hmm. just, yeah, because yeah, you have to remember what they're named. Hey, kitchen, well, yeah. light bulb number 17, please turn on. No, not uh, you, 16. No, I have a much more creative 16. way of labeling light bulbs. <laughs> and I don't have the mansion issue. Group. I, don't, I don't have the mansion issue right behind you, which is the sprawling megapolis that is uh, Chateau de Saint-Ange. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have I have 25 of the smart light bulbs. I'm counting them up. Yeah, 25 smart light bulbs in my house, but they're all grouped. So I can just yeah. say, like, turn off downstairs lights and all of them go Right. Or, yep. right. Lights, go I off. love to go into the bedroom and say, Alexa, turn on uh, Aurora Borealis. And I get like blue and yeah. blue light theme. It's uh, funny, I have that one okay. labeled discotech. <laughs> no, no, no. Discotech is when your Wi Fi gets shut off and then oh, like, goes back on I, and it's disconnected. That is, that <laughs> All the is, lights are flashing. Definitely my jam. And I have it turn on uh, windy trees and rain nature sounds together. Nice. In order to tune out the 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 sound, See, I and this it. is this is what you have to do to adapt when you live in New York. Are, are you finding with how quiet it is in South Carolina that it's a a, a bit less uh, you know kind of stressful? Oh, oh my goodness! I, sirens every two weeks. Yes, I mean it's so much less stressful. I, and actually, when I when I speak to the hotel people that are still working, I feel like they're in more stress than the people who are, <laughs> you know, have are, are now outside the hotel. But um, 
Yeah, it's so much less stressful. And, and I lost 10 pounds and I'm sure that that's what it is. Absolutely. Yeah, I, um, I, I've done a few stints where I've done three or four weeks uh, living in New York just because of way meetings and stuff. And I always find by about the third week, I'm just, I'm wired. I'm really stressed out. Uh, it, you really take for granted uh, having quiet. I'm outside right now and you can't hear anything. Uh, you know, you, you couldn't do that anywhere in New York City. It would be nothing but sirens and loud banging. And yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely, uh, it's nice to have the quiet. And, and I wake up to birds chirping. Yes. Beautiful. <laughs> uh, Tamara asked for your uh, link, Adele, so I gave her your feed and link. Um, oh, and then she also made a comment about how she listens to uh, Jason Stevenson, which it is kind of, it, it is amazing. First off, I mean, podcast in general. I mean, I, I know I've been, and you guys had launched yours, right? You know, your, your stuff, your, your show stuff. Yep. It, it is turning into a kind of a common medium of opportunity for people to be able to have some sort of conversation. As a matter of fact, I did a podcast about podcasting, the tools and stuff anyway. And uh, because I think there is a place, strangely enough. And, and you know, what, Stuart, you should listen to my podcast sometimes because I give you credit at the beginning of every podcast now. Wow. I really? do. There's a, little, there's a little guilt in there for you. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what's the name of this new podcast? You know? This new podcast, yes. The Hospitality Marketing Podcast, the new one, yes. Oh, that one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one that's been out for more years than you let me count. Yeah, that one. <laughs> uh, it is in my feed. I just haven't listened to it in three, four weeks. Four weeks. No, I, I, I have given you credit for many shows now. You and Ed. I've said, and it's my disclaimer. It's my Stuart disclaimer. Kids. Do not try this at home. Make sure that all of your block and tackle things are done first prior to operating any of the following ideas. That I have. <laughs> That's funny. It, it, I do actually say, I call stage. my inner Stewie out and go over and tell him, it's like, look, make sure your SEM, your SCRM, your, your, your organic, your content, your schema, all these things are in line and you've maximized all your baseline opportunities before you attempt the crazy stuff I'm about to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> And then hire Lauren because he's the only one that can execute half of this stuff. You know, if you're going to sell a widget, be the only one that can run the widget. That's my That's model. right. <laughs> that service contract. That's right. <laughs> Use this. You need to hire me to run it. Yeah, but no, it's uh, it's been kind of fun, actually, in the podcast. I've enjoyed doing because it gives me the chance to kind of get down to some funky little tools on, on stuff. And podcasts, one of them. I think, honestly, for the times that we ventured into this, we're not consistent with it. I'll be honest about that. But we're not. But the times we put podcasts out to help with local info or local what to do or local expectation based on the uniqueness of the travel at that time for that one hotel has been. They listen to it. Um, uh, so how did you distribute that? Because it's something we've talked about a lot, and we've never had a client bite on on the concept. But we, we wanted to... we've been only doing it on pre arrivals and on the website content itself. Yeah. That's the two things we've done. So we're in we a situation now it. where close to 50% of adults in, in North America listen to podcasts at least once a week, right? So it, it's become mainstream. It's not a, as fringe as it was. So I think it is a channel. And, and if you think if you're a drive destination, or, I mean, I guess or a flight destination, people listen to audio experiences on the way to your property. So giving them an orientation of what to expect and what to do, I think is a big opportunity for a lot of properties. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it hasn't well, been especially if, if, you know, people are driving in because that's when I listen to all my podcasts is when I'm driving yeah. and uh, watching Marvel movies on the planes. That's right. That's it. Yes. Yeah. You're correct. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. The, the unique is the best statement is how I. <laughs> oh, speaking of nerding. Uh, you, as you know, I wake up early on Friday mornings just to watch the latest Mandalorian so that I've seen it before everyone else. Holy cow. You have to watch ah! it. Holy cow. Now, Stuart, I, have you been watching The Right Stuff as well? Have you started watching that yet? I have That's not. That's also no. Disney+. Plus. It's really well done. Yeah. Uh, it's made our Fridays really nice because they release both of them on Friday. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's really well done. It's the uh, the Mercury Astronauts. Um, and it's really, really good. It's hard to believe it was National Geographic that did it because it is a, it's a show. It's a, you know, a retelling of what the Mercury astronauts 
uh, went through and everything. And um, it's just so fantastically scripted. Uh, the actors are fantastic in it. It's okay. really, really good. Yeah, highly, uh, highly recommend it. Yeah, it's kind of fun. I mean, like I told you about the fact that I'm giving my friend the Oculus. Um, what sold her on it was the fact that I went to the ISS station and went there with the Smithsonian Institute and Time Magazine when they brought the Big 360 camera up. And was that? And that? I'm sorry, what was that done on again? This o o o quack. octopus. O o octopus? <laughs> <laughs> hey, laugh if you will. <laughs> I'm just we will to talk about this. Stuff. By the way, yeah. I watched the Macy's Parade in 360 with the Oculus, which was pretty cool. <laughs> I was right there with the Rockettes. How just much saying. are they paying you, Lauren? <laughs> I wish they were. You'd think I'd make is, money at this Is point. Oculus actually a multi-level marketing scheme? It is. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm on tier two of wannabe. <laughs> because the way you're, the way you're going more. at this, it, it <laughs> this really is feels... Year. This is what yeah, it is. It's, it's yeah. the VR experience by Amway. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Or, or fuller brushes, whichever, how far back you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was pretty cool. Actually, I did watch the, the Mary, 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 Mary Macy's Parade, uh, the Thanksgiving Parade, with the, the Verizon offered it, which I thought was very unique, that you could be in the parade with them and watch the balloons and stuff. So. What I thought was even more unique about it is they promoted that Verizon was offering this on the regular television yep. show. Um, which I, I thought very strange because, you know, the ratings are what pay for them yeah. to do this and to actively promote people off of your channel. Oh, that made me think of something. So we've talked about Hulu ads and how Hulu ads, I'm, I'm actually going to bring this to hospitality because it's really interesting. <laughs> what? So I saw a Hulu ad from Uber Eats. Mm -hmm. that I do not know technically how they pulled this off, but it was an Uber Eats commercial. And in the commercial, they were talking about restaurants that deliver to my location. Yep. And it oh, yeah. wasn't just national. It wasn't just national chain. No, that, yeah, it was like, like some, and, yeah. it's really, so think about this. If I'm, if I'm a hotel group that has multiple hotels in like a, you know, kind of a, sort of distance, I could run ads that are targeted down to zip code um, mm -hmm. of, you know, here you go. Here's the the hotel experiences that are one hour drive from you, two hour drive, because they were rolling it. They were rolling mm -hmm. the Uber Eats restaurants in an interesting kind of graphic. And it took me a couple of seconds, but I'm like, wait a sec. Like, those are restaurants that are right here. And um, yeah, that tech on TV, that's really cool. That kind sure, of I'm targeting. Like, yeah, Jordan, dance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got, got Lauren excited. He's on the edge of his seat right now. He's ready. Well, to I go. did that. I told you the Hulu beta. I have it on the one day. Let me have one client with it. And and I, I told you the, the the tracking is insane. That the, the targeting is insane. It's not zip code. It's down to DMAs and cities. You can wow. have a big city tape. But it's still pretty still, amazing that you sick. can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they ran it in a really intelligent way where it was a fully produced commercial, mm -hmm. but they kind of windowed out this one little area that didn't seem like it was windowed out, and that's where they were doing the dynamic part of the mm -hmm. ad. Mm -hmm. And um, just really, if that's where advertising is going to go on the large screen, it's going to come back. I think it's going to become a primary you know, opportunity because if you can do that type of deep targeting plus the tracking back yeah. um it all of a sudden you're you're in really interesting shape because of the the challenges today is we we all know the consumer has changed to where they're multi-device entertainment at the same time right so um being able to nail timing on the on the mobile device is a little difficult right but now if you can start doing uh dual device targeting you know so know that i'm you know, going to watch the Super Bowl, have some mobile ads on Facebook, things like that, but then also start running, you know, targeted ads on the main screen. That's, mm -hmm. that's pretty sick. That's yeah, pretty I, sick. I just today, uh, as of midnight last night, started rolling the first ad set on Spotify and iHeart for one of the clients. Um, and it has, 
I, I chose a larger DMA for it because I wanted a larger plan. But for 250 bucks, which was the minimum spend directly with them, um, it was basically a cent per connection or per, per view. So 25,000 people over a week's period of time uh, will go over and hear my little 30 second audio ad for my You do video too, and you can do mobile or desktop, whichever way you want to run it. Um, but you, uh, you can do, I'll let you know how the volume goes, whether it actually converts out. We're sending them to our Black Friday holiday specials page and stuff like that. But uh, you're getting that kind of targeting now. The, the, the other thing that just got bumped up was some of these podcast platforms allowing you to advertise on podcasts for the podcasts that allow for advertising drops. It used mm -hmm. to be just generic. If you listen to that podcast, regardless of where you're at, the ad would drop in. Now they're, they just rolled out their newer version of it, and they're allowing for uh, – countries now at least it's still probably not as okay. so, so i'm gonna just start running ads into the fuel podcast then i am I'm gonna start well, we, we are not corporate sellouts yet so we don't actually, <laughs> we try to keep it fuel. as soon as you do i'm gonna be like hey thanks fuel again this is you know, I, i'm wondering what you guys think about this we're thinking about uber eats there's a thing in canada they have uh, stopped permitting Uber Eats or any of those DoorDash, any delivery service to charge more. I I'm not sure if it's all of Canada or just Ontario. Uh, they ha they're limited to 15 percent on uh, on the de uh, on the delivery fee uh, to the actual restaurant. Mm. So and the, and it's up to 20 percent in total fees, whatever that means. Hmm. Um, there's probably a flat fee and a, and a percentage fee. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. So not so, including the tip. Yeah, not including the tip. Sure. Okay. So and, um, yeah. The, so that seems like it was like, hey, this is a good idea. This is we're going to protect our restaurants, protect our consumers. You're screwing the driver. You know what? But Uber, I Uber and driver, Yelp, no matter what, but any you know of them what? aren't going to take. Know, they're not going to take the hit. You know who's going to take the hit if they have to pay thirty percent? A restaurant doesn't have that big a margin. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they just don't, and they're barely trying to survive. A, a restaurant. This is a whole big debate on LinkedIn, by the way. And there's Max, and then there's Alan Young, and then there's <laughs> me. <laughs> I don't think. Uh, to, to your point, I, I don't think that the, the, the drivers were benefiting from that anyway. I don't think Uber was sharing the love with them much anyway. Well, I, but think. I think that's right, right? Whenever governmental interference comes in, oh yeah, they're not going to take the hit. Prices, yeah. it, 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 it trickles downstream. Like it's, it's the corporations are going to find a way to manipulate it to their advantage. That yeah. yeah. I think we got to, you know, America is built on free markets, and 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 I think something like that is not likely to happen here. Canada is a very different place. You look at some of the legislation they put on, and you know, which, which would here be argued that they're against free speech. So I, I don't, I don't see this happening here. But it, I think it's risky. In New York, happening. there is a temporary um, limit. Mm -hmm. In New York, there's a temporary limit. The thing is, I agree in in free market and and all of that. But I also think that there has to be some kind of regulation because the uh, you you can have the bullies, the big mighty bullies, you know, calling all the shots. It's just like I like have OTAs. a deal about OTAs. Yeah, but OTAs never took over, and the reason they but never I, took they over will. is there is no, they can't because <laughs> they're if they go too high in their fees they become a very easy target for other startups to slide in yep. as their value proposition being we're more friendly on the fees. And you saw that happen every time, you know, the OTAs started kind of soaring. And this was back before the major consolidation, but there were like a, a gazillion OTAs at one point, And there were quite a few of them that were running, uh, hey, it's a 10%. You know, mm -hmm. it's a it's basically a commission and uh, they all got kind of gobbled up because they all they they were all able to get to a certain point of scale that then there was kind of the, the great buying. But the great buying also happened because the the margins were coming down. And, oh. and so the same thing exists in, in any type of free market is uh, if you get too greedy, you open the door to be disrupted. 
And, right. and you know, you don't need to put government control on fees like that because the bottom line is let's let us not forget most restaurants had their own delivery drivers at one point mm -hmm. i mean that was a thing and you favored the restaurants who would deliver to your house the only thing uber did was is they opened the rings of how far that would go and they allowed the restaurants to not have to have their own delivery drivers anymore let's not forget that as part of that fee structure, you're not paying an employee to go out on deliveries anymore. And I know they weren't paying them well, but they were paying them something. And so that, you know, it's the, it's not these poor restaurants. It's, you know, if you were a pizza restaurant, you had multiple drivers if you were a good restaurant. And you constantly were dealing with having to manage that operation, having to deal with the complaints, having to do all of that. Uber and, you know, these other, you know, Grubhub and all these ones that have Doing popped that, up yeah. have allowed that to be completely out of the restaurant. And it's no longer a risk for the restaurant. It's now its own entity. Well, there is a fee with that because but they are saving you. prefer to send their own driver. But because... Ooh, I don't know. I mean, maybe in New York, maybe in New York, I would agree with you on that because it is a very dense... And it's a, you know, a big thing. But I think once you get out of the dense city, um, I'm sure the pizza place is happy to not have to carry insurance for drivers anymore. Mm -hmm. um, because that insurance was hefty. Because let's not forget who most of the drivers were for pizza restaurants. They were teenagers. They weren't adults. And, you know, teenagers are expensive to insure. And that's, it's problematic. Um, so, you know, I, I you know, I caution, I always caution, because first of all, the government never does anything well, okay? There's always a, a problem with anything the government does, and you end up having to kind of accept it when the government comes in. Um, the government also never completely does what they're intending to do. I mean, a perfect example is the, the SEC, uh, you know, trying to stop public companies from doing shady crap, and yet shady crap happens a lot, and, you know, it's and, and they're, but they're, they're they because they don't have proper laws to to regulate them. But that's not that's, sometimes that's, we had regulations that were taken away and then right. They but they were right. So but this is the this is my point um, is in getting into, you know, ch laws like what we're talking about, where you're limiting the fee structure that can be charged for a service. That is, first of all, absolutely insanity. That's the government picking winners and losers. Um, you know, secondly, it, it will affect, it, it will be made up some other way. And I'll give you a perfect example, resort fees. Resort fees were the free market's way of trying to get around OTA commissions on certain things. Um, and, and getting around other forms of, uh, you know, costs in business. It will, there'll always be a way that something new is cooked up. It's either going to be put on the consumer or it's going to be put on the business because it's a middleman and the middleman needs to get paid. And uh, if the middleman's adding value, like it, it will get paid. I mean, I don't know if you pay attention to what a meal costs buying through Uber Eats versus going and getting it yourself. There's a big, there's a big difference uh, in, in cost. And, and you know what, for the convenience of not having to go out and all of that, a, a lot of times the consumer just pays it. Yeah. But okay. I mean, I and think this is the point of free market, right? Sometimes you're willing to pay it. Sometimes you're not. And if, if, and, and when there's a supply and demand mm -hmm. situation and the government steps in, it stifles innovation. It stifles new yep. competition coming in. And right. like, there's been times when I've gone to order on, on Grubhub or, DoorDash or Uber Eats, and I use all three of them. I kind of price shop in different restaurants run different, but there's been times when I've done it and I'm like, yeah, that's just a lot of fee right now. I don't want to do that. I'm going to just pop a pizza in the oven instead. So I, I think if you look at this, this market, it's been interesting because Uber really had the leg up. They had the infrastructure. They had the drivers. They had the logistics figured out already. And yet folks like Grubhub and DoorDash were able to slice massive chunks of the market because free you know freedom of, of competition and innovation was was able to happen i think the government stepping in now hold on tim peter's calling 
You said when you invent the ship, you invent the ship right? And um, okay. a couple, a couple of things. We we knew going into the pandemic as another example. Go to webinar was pretty much what most people defaulted using because it was the one that most people were familiar with, common with, or had downloaded to the computer. And then Zoom all of a sudden in February decided to make it open up for free, and all of a sudden they just totally crushed the market. Yeah, I mean, Go to webinar is now a backwatered program. Even Microsoft Teams is is probably more adopted than than they are. And, that's and actually, but, since Zoom did that, GoToWebinar, uh, Microsoft Meetings, all improve. of those have become substantially better yes. to, yes. to try and compete. And that didn't happen because the government stepped in. It happened because at the time, Zoom had a better product. It was the right. better experience. It was less friction. It was less dropped conversations than GoToWebinar. And, and people gravitated to the better product. And so to that end, I think, to in all honesty, and, and I'll say this from a market cycle, that a lot of things that are being used right now first are adaptations to the immediate need, and eventually there'll be a long-term transition. So to Adele's point, I think what's going to eventually happen is we're going to plow ourselves into a, a resistance where these feed models are going to be challenged by something else. What that something else is, who's to say? Maybe a lot of localized restaurants will get smart and use a lot of these free adaptive apps that they simply come down to a matter of marketing. How many people can they get it in their hands to use is really the modifier between it and the convenience factor of the Uber Eats that's already known and established and distributed and marketed compared to some localized free usage where not one restaurant gets to pay for the platform, but through some platform that isn't charging for it, they all decide they want to get on it. Whatever that might be, the, the market's going to shift. But, to that's, something. but that's not going to happen when the government stops the, uh, the greed. But I, and know I know what? that sounds crazy, but stopping Uber from being able to inch up in what they make, you're you're you've created their ceiling that's yep. going to stifle the little guy from coming in. But uh, it's and stifling the little guy from coming in because the restaurants are closing. Because they're not closing because of Uber. They're, 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 they're closing because of government lockdowns, government payment. restrictions, and no government aid is why they're closing. They're not closing because Uber is you know charging them a, a certain amount because yes, they could. Yes, because if they have a ten percent margin, and now instead of delivery being a portion of their business. It's the whole enchilada and they have employees that need to work and they have people that are willing to deliver. Right. But if you're, if you're, and a, if and, you're a and, smart business and person, the, you charge more on your product on these platforms. I mean, you can easily upcharge every single item 20% and you pass it on to the consumer and like it's, it's done. Yeah, and I think that there's, there's lots of examples of restaurants that have not had to rely on this. They've even gotten creative and created their own delivery service and encourage people to, to order direct or they're going to form a co-op with other local restaurants. I, I don't I yeah, don't think it's because of Uber that these restaurants are going know, out of business. I know other I – mean, unless, unless Robert was here and we say he probably lived through this, you figure the transition that happened when we went from horse-drawn to cars. We had paddocks. We had stables. We had – a whole infrastructure to clean up after the streets on them. We had uh, harnessing and block and tackle people that were building stuff and so forth and buggy whips and buggy makers and all this other stuff. And the car comes along and there was probably this transition of what those other things were doing to a point where they no longer could transition. And then things changed. I say this because the things that we're used to, the restaurants with the sprawling seating or the intimate seating or whatever they bought, they bought square footage to operate the way we knew restaurants operated. Regardless of how well the vaccines work or regardless of how well we transition out of this, the social impact of what this does will have its own effect. How much? Ugh, I mean, you know, but the idea of it is, is that our business models will change. Ghost kitchens are a thing. If you said that two years ago, people look at you like you had you know, two heads. What are you talking ghost kitchen? Like, like spooky Halloween thing? But, you know, it's they, they supply know. and demand, right? The, the, the market needs change and the offering has to change. Yep. Jeff Bezos always says it, that. And if Someone's you look at that, the idea of a, right, the idea of a ghost kitchen is actually what restaurants need to be worried about mm -hmm. on the delivery side of the world. Mm -hmm. Because a ghost kitchen usually goes into an industrial space, which is a much lower cost piece of real estate. Real um, they're laid out for volume. 
Um, and it, they're just, they're just far easier to manage. It's less of a team. It's everything about it. And, uh, that's more of a threat than, mm -hmm. than to, to the traditional brick and mortar restaurant. Um, you know, but the other, the other side of this too is, um, you know, Uber and all these platforms have gotten a big boost, uh, through, you know, COVID time. Let us not forget these restaurants, a lot of them would have just closed. They would have just closed. They would have no distribution. Right. Yeah, right. But Uber didn't get to that position because people prefer eating at home. I mean, uh, let's face it. Not all delivery food tastes as good no once it's been delivered than it does when it's How under. Just right. Exactly. And so there's, you know, when times come back to whatever they'll come back to, um, people will dine out again because dining out is a experience that is, you know, part of why you are going, right? Oh, yeah. um, well, and think about New York specifically, because we talked about that. Part of their struggle isn't the extra 10% that they're having to, to eat because of Uber, excuse the pun. It's because there's a lot fewer people in New York than there typically is. People aren't yeah. traveling to New York. People aren't going to Broadway and then going for a meal. Like it's, there's just less demand, which is going to mean, unfortunately, there's going to need to be less supply. There's basic economics, which is right. You know, yeah. Going going to some other yeah. things too is that this is a concept that I worked as when I first went out to Houston, and I think there's going to be a resurgence of this idea. And there's called me on this. It was called Yapas. It used to be called Yapas. And, and there's a place out in, in Houston, it's called Eats Eats. And what it did was it centralized a kitchen that produced some really excellent meals in, in kind of like, uh, not cafeteria style, but in bulk. And then they distributed it into the restaurants, or really were restaurants or stores, that you could go walk in and buy your meal. Now everything's chilled and everything. It's not hot and sitting ready, although we did have hot items for you if you wanted to eat right then and there. But the items were picked up so that you'd bring it home, warm it, and eat it. And so you had this amazing diversity. You'd walk in and it goes back to the old shop and goes, oh, that salmon looks great. <sighs> that chicken looks better. And you go through and you pick what it is you wanted by the weight or size you wanted. You brought it home. You warmed up. It's not a new concept. I'm saying that that happened back then. But now with everything else going on, to your point, if you can prepare food that's wonderfully done where you're not having to cook it because you're tired of cooking, you don't want to have it delivered because of the transition of quality, but you bring it home, have it ready so that maybe not now, but tomorrow you want salmon you know, with lemon and dill and everything else, and you have the warming instructions based on all the new cooking appliances that are out there, you add that to the fact that a lot of people are investing in their home life now. They've had to. You know, I have friends down here that are retired that they would never want a pool in their backyard. They all bought pools because you know what? They're not going anywhere. So they want something to jump in now. And then we're going to So the home experience has gone up. Home entertaining is going to stay and possibly grow. We might go away from once we have the ability to, but we'll go back to it because we're going to get more comfortable having people over to do those things again. And this food medium might be one of those things where I don't yep. want to go to a restaurant. I just, I want to have well, all the real food. I'll give, you, I'll give you a perfect example of it. Thanksgiving. We discovered two years ago that there is a restaurant here that does Thanksgiving order where it's all pre-prepped and you pay them, you, you go pick it up and then all you have to do is warm it up. And I'll be honest with you, it's about 90% as good as if we had just done it ourselves, but it's hours less work and it's actually less expensive. So, uh, so I went over, it's a, it's a, there's a barbecue uh, chain here called Four Rivers. And uh, so I, and they've got it to a T. You walk up to the front of the restaurant. They have a tent set up outside the restaurant. They did this last year too. You walk up, give them your name. You had already ordered it online. They come out with like these, they, they had these custom bags built for carrying large amounts of food. And you can get full turkey, prime rib, mm -hmm. plus yep. all their barbecue stuff. And oh, by the way, the turkey and prime rib are done traditional, not barbecue. Mm -hmm. And um it, and it's amazing. And so yesterday, and oh, and by the way, the turkey and the prime rib, they give it to you in a vacuum packed bag that you can just put it on a cookie sheet, put it in the oven at 225, cook it for 90 minutes, mm. and it's done perfectly, like perfectly. And so, you know, when you look at that concept, some restaurants already do this, like they're, they're a perfect example. And I can't even imagine how much money they make 
on Tuesday and Wednesday um, before Thanksgiving uh, because their restaurant was pumping too. Like they were full of people eating. So they were turning over huge dollars. And so that, that idea of, hey, if you're gonna host, sometimes you're, you're, it's not big enough to cater um, or you can't afford to cater, but sometimes it's too big to cook yourself. It's a brilliant idea of a sous vide yeah. restaurant where you keep everything at proper temperature Leave them in the bags as is, and then when people come to pick them up, they bring them home and put them. They in just, go and and just go home and just go home and sear it. Hey, yeah, we, we did yeah. the exact same thing this this year. There's a restaurant called Magnolias here in Myrtle Beach, and they do the exact same. And, and we, it, it worked out. We had 15 people here. We socially distanced. We wore masks. No, you don't, didn't. You don't you're get the liar. Liar. <laughs> Absolutely, we did. My, my, my not everybody, was, Stuart. I know you're a hugger. <laughs> I got my in-laws with luminous, so we, we had to have the brothers and stuff. So anyway digress we we did it and it, it worked out to like twelve dollars a head like i couldn't cook for that cheap that yeah. kind of a meal and we had like so much food left over it's ridiculous i'll, I'll share you a thanksgiving story from yesterday i'm now the bubba gump of turkey because i had bought so there's this wholesale place down here called bj's wholesale warehouse and if you buy the certain it's a, thing it's you a get, it's a nationwide thing by well the way. no it's not everywhere if i went in texas wasn't in texas it's a it's up the entire East Coast, at least. Oh, well, East Coast. Okay, well, the entire nation. Then. At least. Right. So, <laughs> so I go over sure and you had to buy the these certain things. You had to buy these certain things to get a free turkey. Well, they didn't. By the time I got done picking the right things, which was really annoying, uh, they, they didn't have a limit on the size turkey. So I picked up this 24-pound turkey because oh it was the biggest turkey they had. And I thought, this is before COVID. I'm like, okay, so we're going to have a bunch of people. It'll be great. Big old 24-pound turkey. Blah. Guess what? Not a lot of people, just Renee and I. So I went to cook the turkey yesterday, which is all good and big. It's huge. And I used my, uh, my cooler to hold it. I couldn't flip the freaking turkey in the oven to, you know, where you put the dark side up. So that, and then you put, it was so heavy and I, had, I didn't have the right tools. By the so way, if you want me to change your life, um, Coleman makes an oil-free turkey fryer. So it's an air fryer. Yeah. Um, it is, I've had one for about 10 years now and it looks like a, a turkey fryer. Like it, it, it just, it has its own legs and you just hook it up to a propane tank, drop the bird in. It can do birds up to like 27 pounds you told me about and it, yeah. it, it's amazing. It tastes like it was deep fried. You know, um, we, used to, you we used to, the tailgate. Book, we used Renee to tailgate. Me, when I say I want another kitchen appliance, I'll send you the picture of the look she gives me. <laughs> okay. It's called the, it's called the, the big, it's called the big easy. And uh, if you want to make, you know, cause like the countertop air fryers and stuff, they're all tiny. This thing you can make 40 wings because it has like layers that like this cage you can drop in with layers uh, and you can make 40 wings all at once in this thing and it's the most simple device it's it, there's nothing to break on it like it's so oh. well made but it's so simple that we've had the same one forever and then cleaning it you just once it's cooled off you take it out back and hit it with the hose done like oh, so no, don't 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 ask ed about the steam cleaner either because you're that, all that, wrong <laughs> by the way the best way to cook a turkey is in a brown paper bag it is the the most delicious turkey you'll ever have Brown paper bag. Yep. I've never done that. Yeah, you get you put it on the pan and you stuff it with you just rough chop some onions, carrots, celery, garlic, rub it all over with olive oil, and then get one of the old school um, grocery bags, the yep. paper bags from the grocery store, which a lot of groceries still have. You just have to ask for them, and then you stick that over and staple it on one end. Or if it's a big turkey, you get one on each end and kind of, and then you stick that in the oven. And then you put it at like 375 for about 12 minutes per pound, and it comes out perfect. And you hope to God that those brown paper bags weren't stored in a warehouse with Doesn't like matter. bugs Doesn't and matter. stuff. Uh, uh, they're they're going to get cooked, uh, any of the bad stuff. No, the, the only risk in it is you've got to make sure the turkey or the, or the bag isn't touching one of the elements. The right? elements yeah. Yes, because it will catch on fire. <laughs> yeah, paper won't burn at 375. I think it's. Did you base the turkey, Stuart? Did you base the turkey? You don't need well. to. The bag, the bag keeps yeah. the moisture in. Uh, okay. Yeah, the bag, it, it, it keeps the moisture in, but it's not. It, it lets enough out that it's not steaming it. It's still roasting it. Oh, it's yep. the most moist. So, Del, do you have any Thanksgiving tips since we all hit all our own? <laughs> I have been vegetarian for 33 oh, wow. years. So. I did not know that. I like to eat pierogies and squash for Thanksgiving. Nice. <laughs> wow. It's easy. 
<laughs> I did the uh, sweet potatoes and the potatoes and the, sp the spaghetti squash and the butternut squash. And yeah, we went, we had a lot of stuff other than the turkey. That's for sure. Just for the two of you. Yeah. Well, I love to cook. So opportunity made Thanksgiving. Duh. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> And we had this best steamed vegetables and the green beans and the bread biscuits and the yeah oh yeah. So we we now, had a big debate. Say, I got leftovers. <laughs> we had a divisive debate in the Fuligan camp this past week because we, we're a pretty diverse group from from all over. And um, we have a good number of Yankees and a good number of Southerners, right? And so there was a whole raging debate about dressing versus stuffing. Mm. <laughs> Which way did you fall, Stuart? I, I both. Like I'm non discriminatory And whatever it is, you never actually cook the bird with it in it. Just whichever way you go. Yeah, I don't. I I, I, I I do the garlic and the onion only, and the and the. I don't. I don't. Do I'll stuff tell you what. Inside. Cut an orange. Squeeze some of the orange juice on the skin, and then put the orange inside the turkey with the onions and all of that stuff. Depends where you put the oranges, uh, then it comes out with a whole different turkey look. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, and it was fun. To, you know, honestly, this was a Thanksgiving to be thankful for. I mean, in all fairness, uh, uniquely, Thanksgiving has been a day of Thanksgiving anyway. But considering all that's going on, for us to be able to celebrate Thanksgiving was actually a thankful day because there's a lot of people that did not have that opportunity or those that are having troubles right now that they couldn't even take the time to celebrate anything so for those who were able to think to do thanksgiving i did find it very unique though i mean i find it kind of fun because i don't need anything because i already have everything that i ever wanted uh that black friday I, it's like i don't know what to do for gifts or presents really you did, you see this, did you see the sale yesterday on the airpods pro that amazon and walmart yes. were running yes How are they, 159 for the pros yeah 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 i ordered from amazon they're not coming till january Wow. Think about the demand for that, though. You know, yeah. Well, Walmart they had the regular sold AirPods out. With the, Walmart with the wired sold case, one before Amazon. Yeah, before mm -hmm. Amazon started doing it. So they started doing it as a price match to Walmart. Walmart ran out right before Amazon turned theirs on, and Amazon just let it go. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was like a $70 savings Jeez. on AirPod Pros, um, which – they they generally only discount you know secondary Apple products. You don't normally yeah. see primary products getting discounts like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh it's pretty crazy. Um, and I will say TVs, man, TVs are getting so cheap. There was a seventy inch LG OLED for like sixteen hundred bucks. Seventy inch OLED. That's modern. You know. Yeah. <laughs> technology it's it's crazy that three years ago that would have been an eight thousand dollar tv Incredible. um my my daughter bought her first tv with her birthday money this this month uh wow. and she wanted a tv for her room we told her she had to wait till she was 10 so she turned 10. she bought a 32 inch television for 129 bucks <laughs> yeah yeah oh it's <laughs> i couldn't believe it and i was trying to explain to her that like when i was a kid we had a 25 inch like console TV, you know, that like was like would turn, you know, but it was just mm -hmm. a 25 inch TV. It probably weighed 300 pounds. Um, and that's all we had when I was 10, like one TV for the house. And she's like 25 inches. She's like, that seems really small. I'm like, it was big back then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you now, know? Robert was here. Robert would tell you about the time when they just had, fire and they put a little uh, uh, linen cloth in front of it and they made shadows. <laughs> <laughs> I think Robert did the P.T. Barnum thing with the candle. Oh, yeah, and the... Yeah, 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 that's what it was. But uh, No, it is, it is kind of, and, and also funny, I, I mean, I don't know whether you guys experienced this too, with marketing for Black Friday holidays, it wasn't really this grand announcement kind of stuff. It wasn't like the, okay, we're going to trigger this when. Well, because it, it all like, started two weeks ago because they all knew yeah. if they wanted to maximize their sales, they needed – like I think Cyber Monday is going to be a letdown this year because yeah. Black Friday basically was cyber starting November 1 for a lot of mm -hmm. companies because mm -hmm. they knew that 
they weren't going to get the crowds. They still got crowds. I mean, down here, you know, the news this morning was covering that, you know, there were people in line, but nowhere near what it normally is. Uh Uh, But, you know, the the fact of the matter is, is starting November 1, most companies put their Black Friday deals on. Look at what happened in October. Amazon threw their prime days out and uh, and already Target was running stuff. You know, Walmart did all of November. You're right. But yeah, we did we did an episode on the on the podcast, the Fuel Hotel Marketing Podcast. Um, that award winning one. I told everyone you need to get out early. If if you waited till Cyber Monday this year to run your deals, you're going to be sorely sad because a lot of people yeah. already booked their hotels. We've been running since early November, and they they've done really well. Accumulated accumulatively, they've outperformed previous years. So it's mm-hmm. yeah, it's been good. Yeah. And it's also and now more than ever. The messaging. I think it's going to stick next year. I think people will do the same. November's just going to be a month of sales yeah. moving forward. Which will yeah. be great because then you could actually like stay closed on Thanksgiving mm-hmm. and not open. I mean, because it was starting to get ridiculous where stores mm-hmm. were opening at like three o'clock on Thanksgiving for their mm-hmm. Black Friday. And it's like, mm-hmm. come on, really? Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. didn't have any. They actually in the news down here locally, they made it that there was only one person because it was a tradition that was out front of Best Buy. And he said, this is the first time we've actually had Thanksgiving because Best Buy for the first time was closed for Thanksgiving yeah. all day. So Can they had Thanksgiving and then they showed up and parked outside for, for, for Black Friday deals for Friday. You know, and it's like, OK. But, but one, one thing I do think we should do as an industry, because there's a lot of people still skittish about traveling and, and not ready to commit to, to booking. Right. Because we still there's, there's a lack of clarity related to the recovery timeline, even, even with a vaccine. But at the end of. No, of end of January. So I think this coming year, it's January 26th is um, International Book Your Vacation Day. It's, it usually falls like the last Tuesday of January, I think. And I, do, you I, have I to get people, do you have to get people cards for this? Is this a Hallmark? <laughs> no, well, no. <laughs> but it's something that I think um, a lot of the DMOs, like the, yeah. the international DMOs kind of rally behind. But but I, I would love to see the industry as a whole, like not just DMOs, but the individual properties <laughs> and chains to really promote this as a catalyst. Because hopefully by jan- the end of January, we should have a more clarity, right? We should know mm-hmm. that by I don't know, June, July, August, whenever we're going to kind of be in a better situation and travel is going to be a little more acceptable. So if we could create a Black Friday, Cyber Monday type of event around that that date, I think it would be really good for the industry to try. You know, we're all going to be hurting and recovery is going to be tough. This could be a little catalyst, a little spark that lights the fire behind the industry. Yep. I think it's a good idea. But we need no. the buy-in, right? We're going to need folks like HSMAI and AHOA and and U.S. Travel and HLA to really push it to all the members and, and, and shows like this and our individual podcasts to really try to rally behind that concept. No, I'm, I'm definitely for it. it. I think that it's all a measurement, as you said, as to what people's safety and comfort, because even just the math of if the if the vaccines went out, if all of them went out to their maximum production capability and distribution had no hiccups, problems, issues or whatever from all three of them right now hitting the market, they even said from those that take the double dosages and so forth, not even the partial dosages, it would take until August of next year before there would be enough people with, 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 that nobody would be unwilling to take it. Just the logistics, it would take until August of next year for that critical 70% to be in effect. But the reality is we really only need to get through the first wave of, of you know the frontline workers in the most at risk. Once that's done, we we can pretty much get back to normal. If, if any yeah. one of us got it, the chances are we're going to be okay. You know, it, it's it's the vulnerable people. Well, and actually, as treatment has gotten better, you're already seeing the 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 death rate per infected rate is dropping. Um, right. And you've seen that as they've started figuring out like some even some of its simple stuff, like you know, put the person on their stomach and. Mm you know, give them oxygen and, you know, kind of angle them and you don't have to put them on a ventilator. You're, you're not going to kill them. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, I, I, I agree with Stuart. I think once you're past the high risk, I think once you're past, uh, the first, the frontline workers, um, and honestly, even as you start to put dent into the rest of the general population, it's not, we don't need to get to the level where this is like stomped out, right? We just need to get to a level where it's not going to overwhelm the hospitals. 
And the ones who are most likely to die from it are protected. If you get to that mm-hmm. level, then, you know, for most other people, this isn't a, um, a life or death thing. It's, it's a nasty, you know, flu. And actually for a lot of people, for some reason, it doesn't give them anything. Not as bad as but even yeah, some right. people who don't have a lot of symptoms during COVID say that the chronic illness that they've had after COVID mm-hmm. has been hell and they didn't have a problem really during when they were sick. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. about 10% of the 10% of the people that contract to get the long term effect. I guess, I guess again it goes back to what you're saying is true and I agree with you in the numbers and I also say it's going to be a perception of usage for those people where they're that even though that's happening that people's perception the social impact probably the best way of saying it the social impact of people's uh, behavior is still going to have a residual aspect to the true demands and usages and going out to a degree. Right. But that might manifest in more people wearing masks throughout the year. And that's not a bad thing for society. You know, don't forget Mm -hmm. that 40,000 plus people every year die from flu in in America. Right. So it's not like we don't live with these kind of situations already in how often do you see on the media, how many people have died of flu? It's no, Hey, it's flu season, take your flu shot, but it's not, there's, there's, there's an acceptable, I mean, it sounds really bad, right? Every death yeah. obviously is, is terrible, but there is as a societal level, there's an acceptable tolerance level of this disease. In, in well, and I, I forget where I was reading it, but someone did, you know, kind of, if we covered, um, you know, serious car related injuries and car related deaths at, at the same level, people would never drive a car because the numbers are insanely high on how many people get life alteringly injured or die mm-hmm. from automobile from driving not not from being hit i'm just talking from driving an automobile uh the numbers per day are staggering i was reading an article about it and um you know society accepts that there is a inherent risk to living the challenge is is when something like this comes up that has uh, that's kind of beyond that threshold and, and and quite honestly, if you look at most people, um, once they understood what the kind of here's what it is, uh, those are the people who you're seeing uh, kind of out living their lives because they accept the risk. Um, you know, those of us who don't, you know, kind of look at that as crazy. But the the unknown fear is what you know caused uh, a lot of you know what we've done. Um, and as certain people knew enough, knew that, okay, if I'm, you know, this, this, or this, like this potentially is going to kill me. If I'm not this, this, or this, um, you know, here are my chances that put a lot of people to, all right, I'm fine. And, and they've moved on with their lives. What we need to do is we need to get those numbers to where the majority of the population is in that situation where they feel like the risk level, the risk associated with doing this uh, is acceptable. I will go on with living my life the way I see fit. Sure. It may be slightly modified. It may be slightly altered, but ultimately I'm, I'm no longer uh, going to, you know, stay in, stay in my house nonstop. Right. I I agree with you. And I think travel is going to be generational because I'll tell you, I mean, I don't know with, with Russian roulette, you know, one bullet, six chambers, spin, click, spin, click, until eventually odds are against you. And being the oldest one on the show today, uh, I will go over and say that as things go forward, things that you never, ever worried about, you worry about now as you move forward in life. The things, you know, I don't think anybody right now is worried about falling. But I can guarantee you when you start getting into your 60s, you're going to be worried about falling because falling means permanent hurts. And so... Same too with this, even though the odds might be down and as mentioned, you know, the impact of what can happen to you can go up and it's acceptance of risk. You can't run your life fearful of everything, but by the same token, you can be smart enough to realize that there's times that you shouldn't take the risk because it's too inherent. Four people died in cars down here this over this weekend. Their Thanksgiving's forever changed from exactly what you just said, car accident, mm-hmm. stupid car accidents, drunk person in a ditch, drunk person in a, in a canal, drunk person hitting head on with somebody else. You know, that should stop people from drinking. Doesn't. Doesn't stop them from getting out of a car. But I know. Listen, let's talk about the thing that COVID still hasn't beaten. 
in numbers, which is heart disease. I was about to bring and, it up. We yeah, are still bring it's, still it's not even bacon. close yeah. to the to the annual deaths caused by heart disease. Absolutely. And yet it is not still... nearly it, like heart disease doesn't even get the billing that cancer gets. And, and you know, cancer is number two. Um, but heart disease, the amount of people it kills, yet people still smoke, people still drink, people still live sedentary lifestyles. Um, you know, people have, and no one's losing their minds about it. And, right. you know, and, you know, people say, well, it's not the same thing because, you know, COVID's a contagious thing. Heart disease isn't. Yeah, but you're not holding any companies liable for their, you know, kind of role in driving well, the heart disease issue. Right. You're uh, not chasing includes, Dunkin' Donuts down because they didn't right. add on some super Well, but donuts. like, let's go even bigger than that. The sedentary job market where, you know, there are people who sit nonstop all day, every day, like nothing's being said about, Hey, you need to make your workplace safe because mm -hmm. you know, heart disease, even though heart disease is killing an insane amount of people a year. Um, you know, the, the fact that you can still, um, uh, buy cigarettes, uh, vaping, all of that stuff that is just horrible for you. Well, just and, as you pointed out, where whatever government rule comes up, somebody way, finds a way of working around it. Cigarettes right. are prohibitive. Oh, guess where vaping came from? Right. You know, it's it's it, there's a there's a methodology to getting around this stuff. And I'll be and honest, it doesn't turn important until I'd rather you have walk that through a cloud of cigarette smoke than walk through a vape cloud. Oh, vape clouds are the worst. <laughs> oh. But also, it's not as immediate. So you go to a party, and then and and a week later you can't breathe that's mm. not what happens when you smoke no it, well i well i completely understand that i mean if we talk about you know if we're really going to say as a society that we want to take great efforts to stop things from killing people then you know heart disease would be one of the easiest ones to have like you could get heart disease out of the top three by doing the types of crazy stuff we've done to stop COVID from killing people. Now, I'm not saying we overreacted to COVID. I think we reacted correctly. Um, I think the investment that we've done is correct. I think protecting uh, people, I think all of that is correct. But when we're talking about moving forward, when you're talking about stabilizing COVID to being because quite honestly, with uh, the vaccines, if they're truly going to be 94% effective, you're going to get COVID down to flu numbers uh, as far as deaths a year. People will go back to normal when that happens. It's not going I don't to be. Disagree with you on that. I think I think what the key element to this is, and I got use it as a friend of mine that tried to start a cottage business and quickly got shot down. He thought about running around to doctors' offices and helping them and additionally sterilize things for those who are feeling susceptible going to the doctors' offices during COVID. Like I'm going to do the extra cleaning for you, so forth and so on. And he thought that the doctors would love that because then it makes some patients who are high susceptibility safer. And the doctor's office's response was, no, nah, we're okay. They can't hold us liable for it if they, something, if they catch it, if they came in because of, of staying with us. So our society is based on blame. If I can't get blamed for it, why should I worry about it? So, you know, and I don't mean to pick on Dunkin' Donuts because I think they're great donuts, but or Krispy Kremes, whatever. You know, if I can be told that I can make you something that technically isn't healthy for you, but you enjoy it and I can sell it. So I make money from it and you get heart disease. You can't blame me for eating my donuts, you know, right. and that's a shame. Now, well, some it's only but it's only that way because there's no societal outrage about it. Right. Let's, As let's a society, be honest. If we got mad about those things and I couldn't sell donuts because people were like, what are you doing trying to kill people? Right. You know. Right. And yeah, you also see some of how the governments on some countries are, are reacting. Canada has bubbles. They have bubbles now up there that you have very stringent rules to be in an area, period. Can't leave, can't go, can't do this, can't do that, can't be here, can't do these things. And even with that kind of lockdown of government intervention, their rate, their numbers are going up because you can't stop the aspect of what is going on with this because people are still going to do what do they do to get around it uh, what, you, what can't, the, you can't stomp out a virus in a free society at all no. like oh, well, what you ben can said slow here. it down you can you know you can stop it from completely overtaking you um but you're going to have the same amount of people infected as the virus is going to do in its natural course it's how long how long do you draw it out uh, to stop it from completely, because the problem is when you go over the the hospitals, uh, you know, abilities to treat, um, you're caught. You're going to magnify the amount of deaths 
um, because people aren't going to be getting effective treatment. You're going to exhaust resources and that's just going to cause, you know, a, 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 like a 20, 30, 40 X multiplier on the death rate. That's what the lockdowns, at least in the US, were supposed to be about. Where people have gotten weird, and I can understand why you'd get weird, is people seem to have forgotten that. And a lot of the lockdowns that you hear talked about today, or even the the procedures you hear like kind of being tossed around by certain states and stuff, I think people have forgotten that, you know, it's not a problem if you're running, you know, with 20% capacity available in your hospitals and you and you can do that with 7000 cases a day in your state you're okay it's you know cuz understand most hospitals generally only have a 5% available capacity they're run optimally um you know it's not the you you will not stop a virus by causing people to go home and stay home that it that's not how it works you just slow it down a bit it will linger until you have real treatment or vaccines like it's just going to be there. And whenever you try to open up a little bit, you're seeing it in New York. New York's numbers look a lot closer to Florida's numbers since they've opened up a little bit. And, it, it, you know, you would have thought, oh, no, New York locked down so severely for so long, like they should be able to open up. And and people almost seem surprised that, like, they have cases again. And it's like, no, it's not how this works. Right. I mean, it's well, not how any of this works. To that end, I agree. But also, again, it goes back to you, you – you have to take care of yourself if you're worried about certain things. Uh, I know just from medical things of it, you can't just trust that the doctor knows everything that they need to know that everybody's, you know, before it used to be polite that if somebody didn't wear a mask, you're like, oh, well, I'll, you know, now it's like, hey, dude, you want to talk to me? Mask. I, don't, I ain't talk or get the hell away, heck away from me. I don't want to deal with you. Um, I have business. If they're not going to ask for people to mutually share the safety of everyone else, I'm not coming in. And it's a free economy. Those that yep. do, that don't care, go right ahead. I'm not, yep. but that that's the only power I have influence on right now is what I can take care of myself for at this point. So I appreciate stores that enforce consistency of mask usage because we don't have uh, controls outside of that right now that are measurable. So if they, if, if you know, there's a guy down here that's suing the local government because they, he, they tried to enforce mask mandates at this store and he, he refused to do it and he's a big Trumper and all this other, and it's like, I'm, I'm not going to give a dollar my money and I might be, I may never ever hurt your business, but you'll never get mine. Right. That's all Same I can do. reason why I will not ever give Walmart a dollar of my money because I hate what they do to local economies. Same reason why I will never give Chick-fil-A a dollar of my money because of the way they ha actively hate people. Um, you as a consumer have the power and don't be mad when your power is not enough to completely stomp out a business, but you can at least sleep better at night knowing that you had principles that you lived by. I would give Stuart a dollar for his podcast, though. I do. I would do that. I'd give Stuart a dollar for his podcast. <laughs> we have delicious chicken just like Chick-fil-A. So, <laughs> Hey, from a marketing without perspective. Without the hate. They serve without their the chicken hate. without hate. Yeah. Exactly. yeah right? No, hateless chicken. Uh, so... From a marketing perspective, you can't talk about all joy and happiness and holiday, but you can talk about the joy of the holiday. It's like a fine line right now. You can talk about the happiness that the holidays can bring. As a matter of fact, they just talked about in the news recently here that put your decorations up early if you have them. If not, go get some or whatever. Get into the feeling of holidays, that mental – we talked about the last show. The mental anxiety, the anguish, the depression, the uncertainty is real. It's physical. It, it hurts people and unfortunately can push people to do terrible things. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there, there's a message from marketing that we can do it without being overt, like, oh, bye, 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 stay, 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 do, do, do. It's like we can't push that, but we can push the, hey, you have loved ones. Everybody wants to travel eventually. Here's a way of buying something for them that they can enjoy when they feel safe about travel. And, stuff. and it's a fine, I mean, some of my clients have, gift cards programs and they're phenomenal. They're selling crazy good. And then the other clients don't have them. And I'm sorry, I'm going to bash brands. What the heck aren't you guys doing for, for, for some sort of buy without having to stay thing this point, you know, buy a thousand points for a hundred bucks. Really? You know, it's absurd. The, the lack of brand support to substitute purchase is what I'm thinking of gift cards are for people to stay in future tense. They're not doing anything for that. There's no incentive other than buy now, stay now. 
that the brands are offering to their brand constituencies. And it's frustrating because a lot of people probably would buy something that will allow them to travel in the future tense and not by making a reservation in the hopes that they don't have to bump it to a later date, which is all the only option the brand hotels have right now. By the way, I mean, the other thing, like there still have been no really like big outbreaks linked to any uh, hotels, right? I still haven't seen any in the news. Travel no, well, the whole surface cleaning thing is still a little baffling to me. Yes, I still wipe things down when I get them from a store. You know, when I you know, do the curbside, pop the hood, they drop the stuff in, and off we go. But I still wipe everything down. But the contagion from that is very small. But I still do it as a safety precaution. Um, but well, good. I think hotels have done an excellent job, and, and part of this is because of the the responsiveness early on from governmental and, and you know local government a lot of times and then regional and national, but setting regulations about what, what are the protocols that you should, you know, in, introduce to try to keep your staff safe. Cause, cause really you think about you, you visit a hotel, unless you're sitting right on the pool deck. And even then you're not really interacting a lot with a lot of other staff in, in a way that's risky behavior, right? You're not spending mo multiple minutes talking to or right in front of, another guest it, it's you're very isolated in a lot of times in a hotel if you're doing it right and people deliberately are, are, are taking that to the extreme right now so the the chances of you contracting it because you're going to a and staying in a hotel very very s small now if you're going out to restaurants it's a whole different ball game because you're li literally sitting close to other people and people are walking by you going to the restroom and, and things like that but hotels themselves because the staff are protected, the risk of you contracting it or, or there being a mass outbreak is negligible at this point. Right. Yeah, the thing so, that I'm more concerned about, even eating outdoors in a restaurant, the last two times I did that and we like scoped out the patio first, made sure we were going to be, you know, 12 feet away from the other tables. Mm -hmm. And then the waiter comes up to you with the mask on and then drops their mask yeah. to talk to you. What is that? <laughs> it is amazing. I would call that out. I would call that out but, immediately. But this is also like the, people's inabilities to understand like safety, like com now completely makes you understand why there are so many unplanned pregnancies because <laughs> people obviously don't understand that like the nose hanging out of your mask, you might That's as well good. not, you're, you're actually just making yourself uncomfortable for no reason, like might as well just not wear a mask because you're you're not wearing a mask. Um, you know, the people who do that pull it down to talk, first of all, masks aren't some magic, like sound device where you can't, sound can't travel through them. You think that sound is coming out differently because you hear yourself differently. People can still hear you. You don't have to move your mask. Um, it, it, it blows my mind. Or the people who are like, you know, drinking water while walking with a, with no mask on, and they're like, "Well, no, it's okay. I'm I'm drinking, and and you know, it's no problem." It's like, yeah, but you're breathing out of your nose breathing. while you're drinking. Stand my, still. Stay away from people. One. Drink. Saw, put the mask back on. I was at a I was at a meet. It was the first in person meeting. It was for a local organization, and and they did an excellent job, like enforcing masks and and. and all that stuff. And there were a couple of people throughout that it was a couple of days. There were a couple of people that would pull down their mask to, to speak. And a lot of people would say, let's, let's keep them up. But I did see one person literally pull down their mask, cough, and then pull their mask back up. <laughs> yes, I saw that too. That's a, I'm like, a grocery store. You're missing the point. Well, yeah. and, and if you ask them, they'll probably tell you because it's really gross to cough in your own mask. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. Yeah, try sneezing in your mouth. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, well, my son, my son, um, whenever the he walks out into the sun, like for the first time, sneezes, never fails. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, he always puts his mask on in the car. And then we go out to go to the parking lot to go to wherever we're going and never fails, sneezes in his mask and is like, oh, my mask is gross now. Cause you know, he's six. So he's producing gross yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And we're like, Eddie, wait till we're about to walk into a place to put your mask on. And he uh, never fails. He's got his mask on. <laughs> <laughs> Poor thing. Gross. So gross. It's a bad All right, listen, 
I, uh, I, and speaking of family, they are here. They're back. I, uh, right. I had a little break. I, it was really nice to see you Dude, all. Thank Thanks. you so much for making it. I really, I thought, and I sincerely appreciate the effort the day after Thanksgiving and everything. And thank you. Sincerely appreciate you being here for it. All right. You all enjoy. Uh, enjoy I'll talk you. to you next, next week. Yep. Bye, Ed. Thank you. Bye, buddy. <laughs> Yeah, well, what was it? Ben was talking about the fact as they did regional or citywide or city lockdowns in England, that he had people that were going to drive out of the lockdown to go to a city that they could drink in, then come back. And it's kind of like, I think you're missing the point of the yeah, lockdown. <laughs> so, Stuart, what's the what's the rest of the rest of your weekend looking like here? I mean, you're not working, right? Right. Um, I have some work to do today. Yeah, but um, not a lot. I, I, the family's left. They just came in for the day, and and again, they they were appropriately behaved and be masked throughout the, the experience. Now, is this is this your wife's family or your family? Yeah, it was it was her family. Yeah, people okay. in England don't celebrate Thanksgiving. Well, so. they come over though as an excuse, or maybe they just already lived in the air because no, they want to hang around thing you. called COVID. I don't know if you've heard about it. I know, no, no. I was just thinking that they want to hang around you so badly yeah. that they made amends. You know. <laughs> no, no, it was my wife's family. It, it's honestly, it was the first time. So typically we would go a uh, couple of hours inland from where we are to her extended family, all the aunts and uncles. And there's like a hundred people plus would gather together and eat buffet food that everyone brought. And it, it would, it would have just been a nightmare. So we decided this year we would not do that. And we just had my wife and her mom and dad who live with us, my two boys, and then my wife's two brothers one of whom's single, and then the other has has a couple of kids. So it wasn't too bad. Um, but, yeah, they, they've all left. So it's just us, my, my four, and then the, the grandparents now. So back to normal. What would you so do? Yeah. Now that you have the house that doesn't have the extra space, secret room to it, where did everybody sit? <laughs> so that's why we moved. So if I had I known before we bought this house that I had a secret room in the old house, we might not have had to move. But because the in-laws were moving in with us, we needed more space. So we moved to a house that has like a little mother-in-law suite behind the main house. So it gives them privacy and independence, but lets us keep an eye on them as well as they, you know, yeah. as they do. Adele, what did you guys do? Did you stay at home quietly or did you? Yeah, you we had a Zoom with my, uh, with my brother, who's a doctor and his wife. And uh, they're in New York, but they're moving to the South too. They're going to... Um, the Atlanta area, Alpharetta, and uh, and my parents, uh, my 86-year-old parents managing their Zoom. It took That's a little okay. talking what? through. <laughs> it. My mom is pretty amazing. That's cool. <laughs> I don't know what I did with my parents. They, they are technically challenged, let's say. That's the nice way of putting it. So I bought them an, an Echo Show, the screen Echoes, yeah, from Amazon in I have one in my kitchen. They have one in their living room. And because it's both on my account, they can just drop right in to, to either, either device. So I can just say drop into Nanny or she can say drop into Stuart's kitchen. And we, like they don't have to touch. Okay. Technology. They just, okay. yeah. It's so Sounds perfect. perfect. It's, it's yeah. Sounds it, perfect. Yeah. Great. By, by the way, Adele, you are timeless. You sent some old pictures up. What well, you said were old pictures. I swear to God, you have not changed. However many years back those pictures were <laughs> now, I'm always like, oh, I didn't know she was, a, you know, at, at such and such a fan. I'm like, wait a minute. She's like, oh, 10 years ago this. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> <Ten years ago? laughs> you didn't change oh, at all. It's like, you. dang. Meanwhile, yeah, I look at pictures of like, That means a lot to me because I had Bell's palsy on both sides of my face, which uh, I, I thought was, I thought I would never be able to show my face again. And, you know, it took a couple of years to heal, but I'm so grateful. Uh, no, you have not changed at all. <laughs> Honestly, I was looking at the pictures. I'm like, yeah, but what's she doing there? And then I'm looking at it, and it's like 10-year-old picture. I'm like, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> me, and Ollie, me and Ollie, the TripAdvisor owl. <laughs> and that was one of them. Uh, yeah, there was a few that you popped up. And you, you with some of your friends, too. You had uh, some pictures of you and your, some of your friends. Oh, like, yes, yes. No, all good ones. See, I'm, I'm, I'm a. What, what is it when you stalk somebody on, on Facebook? But you don't see. <laughs> yeah, cyber stalking. That's all it was. It's, it's but when you went cyber stalking, what did you do? And what's your plans for the weekend, Laura? Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm actually um, after the show. I'm purposely not working today, mm -hmm. uh, other than the show and making the podcast. Oh, this and isn't then, work. This is fun. This is fun. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. 
I, after this, I'm going to do the podcast, and then we're going to go hop on the boat because it's going to finally get chilly down here. It's going to get into the 50s next Tuesday. Ooh. Wow. Oh. Yeah. So uh, we're going to go hit the boat today and kind of it's beautiful, sunny, and uh, probably everybody and their brother's on the water, but we don't care. We're just going to go putt-putt around and uh, bring the puppy out with us and uh, just hang out on the boat while the weather's still warm and toasty and stuff like that. <laughs> That's and can I just point. say, Lauren, that you called it at the beginning of the show that your hair, as as the episode oh, yeah. went on, would start <laughs> to get some volume it's to it. Turn into hippie length. I didn't put any, normally I put gel in to hold it back, and yeah. this time it's like, you know, if you take it, look. Yeah, it's getting some long length to it, bro. <laughs> yeah, it's got it's got I got the hippie beatnik look going on nowadays. It's which a is holiday weekend. I have gone to the barber forever and I used to have a ponytail when I used to own restaurants, so it all worked out really well. It's like, yeah, I'm just going back to my days of when I first met my wife and was like, Hey, if you don't mind it, I'm just gonna go ponytail it and you know. <laughs> She's like, Yeah, no problem. So I'm back to the ponytail. That and I'm shedding some pounder. So who knows? Maybe I'll get back to my svelte, little long haired, bony tailed self. So <laughs> we won't recognize you. <laughs> Plus, I'm also going to just, just stir it because I want to throw it in there one more time. I will be getting on my Oculus tonight because I have some newfound friends on Population One. And mm. we're going to, it's a great stress relief. Really. Actually, to be honest with you, I've been using the Oculus more for going places. The 360 experience is so cool. Plus, Oh my last trips I did with the 360 camera. And I'm like, wait a minute, I can use Final Cut Pro and make the videos and I can go back on my vacations again. So that's literally what I'm doing is, is, is making the 360 videos. And I'm going back to when we last were over in Europe, uh, visiting my family and walking around again because I was holding the can up on a stick like a, a tour director, you know, yeah, people looking like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, dark. you know, so and then, oh, then I had, I found a whole batch of videos that I did hanging the camera out of the car where my brother-in-law drove because we we're looking at going down to South of Holland. And so I had the camera sticking out of the car and I'm like, Ooh, so I put all those together. <laughs> so I've been having fun doing video editing and uh, reliving my trip vacation tour. So yeah. Thanks. Thank you. That's <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Have oh, you seen the uh, article about, uh, or many, many articles about Accor and the new lifestyle brand? I mean, if you can call right. it the new oh, lifestyle brand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think, what was the name of it? Ennismore with the yeah. Hoxton group. The, uh, they bought, of course, invested $300 million buying SBE. Mm -hmm. which had like the Delano and Hoxton and what is the name of that very posh golf resort in Scotland. It, it was just named like the number one hotel in the world. Green something. Green, Glen Eagles. Glen Eagles, um, right? Um, yeah. Okay. I, it makes me crazy when I think about Accor having all of these lifestyle brands. I love it. I love the concept of independence, but it, it sounds like they're going to try to find a way to make it work and and uh, and have them a little bit off to the side under the what is it called? Ennismore instead of Accor, but it is Accor. Yeah. Yeah, and it, this is kind of following up on what we talked about last week with just shifts in, in general and more people going away from the big flags. And, and I think this is a, a smart play from them, right? It's a defensive move from people trying to do their own thing or creating their own little new nuanced brands. I think I think it's smart. They, I mean, they got some high-end properties, some, some top-notch yeah. I'm going to say it now just because I think this is a possibility of it. I think... Coming out of this, I mean, the problem for lack of a better term, because I don't know what you have the way to refer to the fact when people start emerging from you know what they're dealing with now to when they want to travel, there's going to probably be a huge opportunity. Like you point out, Stuart, brands have really failed in their relationship value. To, to and, varying degrees, right? Not all of them. Very, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, yeah, that is true. That's very fair to varying degrees. But yeah. you take something like you just talked about, Adele. And you approached me with some offer saying, hey, it's travel's coming back or, tra you know, you're, are you thinking about traveling? Build a relationship with us. We will treat you differently when you walk into these particular hotels or resorts. We'll give you this value proposition when you do this. That whole loyalty relationship, if it is done not from a frequency thing like, oh, after you stay with us our 10th time, you get this. But rather, start this way. Mm -hmm. We'll do this with you. Now, if you like it, then you're going to pay for keeping it or whatever. But that whole loyalty relationship opportunity 
tour operators, packaged offers, soft brand uh, um, uh, loyalties, all those things will probably have a whole new value relationship opportunity because you're telling me that you're going to take care of a lot of the minutia that I didn't have to worry or that I would you know, be worried about normally. You're going to treat me special because I'll come and stay with you kind of thing. I think it's pretty cool of an of a opportunity, I think. Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I I really I really question whether what they call loyalty programs how effective that is anyway. I I think that I mean, I I make all my decisions based on experiences. Mm -hmm. Why not just give give up front what it is that you want people to remember you by? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that instant gratification. We we did this is probably five years ago now we did a, a study and we looked deep at loyalty because because the argument a lot of people make is that the big guys they're not really loyalty programs they're rewards programs but they're not not done in a way that is, is good for the consumer necessarily and and you even said this last week adele that you have you know you're a member of just like 10 different loyalty point sure. systems and i i am too and so when i travel i'll try to look to see what what I gain the most in that that decision right there in instant gratification in the study that we did a few years ago we, we asked would you prefer to get you know a 20 percent value of your stay now or a 40 percent value of your stay later and people would rather get it less but now than more yeah. and later it's overwhelming like 75 percent of people so that instant gratification those perks if you if you really your job is to try to get people to stay with you every time they make a decision, the best way to do that is through that instant gratification every time. And it doesn't and have to cost you as much. Yeah. I, I also think that they set themselves up for un uh, delivered expectations. Yep. Because I am always hearing from brand hotel, you know, a front office managers and people like that, that they're getting constantly complaints about people who didn't get to uh, get into their room early, that didn't get the upgraded, but don't you know who I am? I'm a whatever, whatever, and I was able oh, to yeah. do it before. And you're always, and, and, and somebody was telling me how excited that they were because they were able to get from 63% guest satisfaction to 67% guest satisfaction because he was able to like maneuver some of that things and so to have less complaints from their loyalty members. Yeah. That was causing the, the complaints. The yeah, I talked talk to the, the GM at a, a, a Marriott, a high-end four-star Marriott property, and she, she always says that the, the high end, I forget what's their top tier, like Cobalt or something, the Marriott Rewards or Bonvoy. Uh, she says when they know that they're staying, they just buckle up because they know they're going to be the biggest pain in the butt. And yeah, always, always was. Even the diamond ones for Hilton. So just, it was always those people walked in thinking they owned the hotel. I mm -hmm. mean, they yeah. feel like they deserve everything. They feel like they got all this leverage, right? I'll take my business to someone else. Right. You know? yeah. Okay, yeah. Let me ask you just a okay. What is the most stayed at hotel you either of you have ever been in? Most repetitively stayed at hotel, not because you had to for the fact that you know you, where you a worked specific at or anything hotel like that. or brand. Nope, specific hotel. Huh. And how many times was it? Well, mine would probably be um, due to sports travel, so I don't know that it counts. But that we, my kids would play travel soccer, and we so we spent a lot of times going to. Charleston, South Carolina. So we, we ended up, for whatever reason, the team would always stay at the, the Spring Hills Suites in um, North Charleston because Spring Hills set up, you know, you get the breakfast included, it's good Wi-Fi, the room layouts are great for, you know, a family of four. So that that's, it's not my favorite hotel. It's not through choice necessarily. No, but no, no, just the most frequent one that you've ever stayed at. Yeah. It was that. Think, How was that, do you think? For me, it was Turnberry Isle, which is now the JW Marriott, by the way, mm -hmm. because it was it's, I could walk to my parents' house. But when I was there, I was at a resort. I was mm -hmm. at a resort with a beautiful pool, with a golf course in my view. Uh, I could take, uh, you know, a, a lesson in something, get a massage or my nails done. And all those beautiful things. I had that complete resort experience right next door, you know, walking to my parents. 
and mm -hmm. it, when they used to live in Aventura and um, and they were dog friendly and so it was great in that way and it really wasn't much more at all uh, they they had so many other uh, Marriott and Hilton and other kind of hotels in the area, but it was not much more at all to get so much mm. more experience. But I also thought that I could maybe help them out uh, enhancing their their interdepartmental communications. <laughs> <laughs> How many times did you stay there for the whole time that you've ever been going back and forth? How many times did you stay there? Um. I don't know, maybe less than 10, I would say, but okay. near there, yeah. Stuart, how many times have you stayed here? Yeah, probably around a dozen, maybe. And for me, my mind, strangely enough, was Spring Hill and Mobile, Alabama, when we're going back between Dallas and Florida, that was our halfway stop, and we loved that. I told you many times stories about that, you know, when we were moving big trucks and stuff, that uh, the parking lot I could drive through without having to back up because I suck at backing up. Um, but the idea is this, it goes back to what you just said. Even if I went to that hotel and they offered just what you said, Stuart, 40% later, 20% now, I still take the 20% now because I would never bank, even though I thought I'd be coming back, I wouldn't bank on the fact that I would be. So I'd much rather take advantage of the benefit now. Mm -hmm. And I bet, I mean, even if I look at places I've traveled to, the most frequent destination about a preference travel is maybe even three, four times at the same hotel, you know? Maybe if an event that was at the same location a couple of times or whatever, or or I had to go to a conference in a certain city like Minneapolis when, you know, for HSMA or something like that, I'd stay at the same hotel because I knew it and I knew how close it was to walking and so, but still only a handful of times. Yet yeah, you make a great point. And Adele, you did the same thing. We base it all on this, oh, we want to offer you this lifetime relationship, long value. You come back, we're going to treat you special thing. When in fact, it doesn't really happen in the, in the volume that we want it to be, why not? Our whole existence goes on what we, somebody said to us about us today. We're only as good as our last guest. And if we're, we don't please them now, giving them value now, them coming back in the future as much as we'd like to, they're going to come back because they, they get benefit to it now. They're going to come back later and try to get the same benefit. Why put the carrot on the stick and make, say, oh, you got to come back another three more times before I give you something, which is kind of the basis of what you said. So it's a frequency program. You know, it's it's that's that's not a loyalty program. That's a you show up enough times, we'll treat you special or speak, you know, treat you different program. Yeah, uh, almost like a quid pro quo system. There, there was another property that I'd stayed at a lot. It was near my mother in law's house, and we used to travel to visit them. And we, we I probably stayed there half a dozen times, maybe ten at the most. But then, um, and, and it was convenient. It was right near her house. It had the amenities. It had a breakfast, things like that. Um, but then. The quality went downhill, right? The mm. staff weren't as friendly. I think it went through an ownership change, rebranded, re and um, the staff were not as friendly, and the rooms weren't as clean. I've never stayed there again since. Like I went yeah. one time, had a bad experience, won't ever stay there again. It's not even an option. Doesn't yeah. matter how many points or rewards I get long term. If, if I have a shitty experience that one time, you're done. I told you about that one time I had that hotel in Virginia, and they were a courtyard was opening up down the road and most of their corporate travel, they said, Hey, look, we love staying with you and everything's great. The restaurant's great. Service is great. Rooms are beautiful and everything, but I'm going to go stay at the courtyard because I can build my points up. So when I can bring my family for vacation, I got the points to burn. And we mathed out the frequency of those guests, three to five stays per year mm -hmm. as to how many points they would get going to the courtyard instead translated that to dollars and said, we'll give you a $50 check to stay with us this year. Go get your points someplace else. But when you come through our town, stay with us and we give you 50 bucks. And we kept them yep. because they they actually enjoyed being with us. It's just they found a different motivation to go someplace else because they had to stay through the market. But again, it goes back to what you guys both keep saying is like, it, they have to enjoy the experience now. They're going to talk about it now. They're going to they're, they're going to do a review on it now. They're going to go over and think about coming next time because of how they stayed now, not because they get a free bottle of water the next third time they show up, yeah. you know, <laughs> which is a shame. All right, because, ladies yeah. and gents, this has been a pleasure, but I'm getting yeah. Old, you know what? And I'm going, yes, let's, because you know what? It, it's a holiday day technically, so we will not burn the two hours as we normally <laughs> tends to do, but I, because I'm going to go on the boat and go on my Oculus. <laughs> Stuart, on, octopus on your boat. Okay. On my boat. No, no, don't no, no bad combo on that one. Bad combo on that one. But 
Yes, I'll take more 360 videos. So, uh, Stuart, when you eventually join the technology world, I will have videos to share with you. Hey, it's in the hand, hand of, of the gods right now. And by that, I mean my wife. I told what I want. Tomorrow, eventually, we're going to have you join us on the show. You are always more than welcome because you have been wonderful joining us on a regular basis. We'd love to go over and hear and see from you sometime in the near future. So please, we always feel knowing that you can come join us if you ever like to. Adele, thank you for being uh, with us. So also. It was awesome. And That's oh, great. for that matter, you know, hey, you have a podcast. It's now on iTunes and everything else. If you want to listen to your podcast, where do they go? Um, you know what? You know better than I where to go for the podcast. Sorry. You got to put the link on your website. <laughs> you search for Adele on podcast. <laughs> I, I I will take the link that you shared with me and put it on my LinkedIn. Thank you so much for that, Lauren. And, <laughs> and uh, everyone, please visit Aspire Reputation Marketing. Uh, if you're looking for some uh, great advice for how to pick up the, the reputation or the amount of five star reviews you get. I'm hearing sorry. I, I'm sorry. But, yeah. Come to my, my website and book yourself for a uh, pre reputation assessment. It's going to be great. It's been a lot of fun uh, meeting people that way. And uh, I think everybody's really, really good. So I hope I invite you to that. And I'm going to be making a presentation for South Carolina and North Carolina. Thank you, Samaya. Um, Stuart Lauren, I'm going to share with you the link to that if you wouldn't mind sharing with that. Oh, I should probably put it here. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I say, I'll put it in the show notes as well, too. But the uh, uh, I also recommend to anybody, if you're, not, you're already not following you on LinkedIn, they should follow you. Put up some great articles. Stuart, not so much. But Melissa does a great job. Just <laughs> Stewie, you know. I've, Melissa I've been rocks it. From LinkedIn for a while. All right. Challenge accepted. <laughs> I'll up my LinkedIn game. Yeah, I was about to say, Melissa has it going on. Plus, Melissa is joining up on some pretty cool presentations as well. So to Adele. I mean, you guys have been hooked up with some great presentations, Stuart. I know you guys just pulled off a really good one as well. But um, Melissa, is, I mean, she's on a one coming up next week, right? It's next week that Melissa's no, got she hers. She just had it last week. She, she oh, was it last? Oh, I yeah. remember that one. I thought there was another one she had coming up on it as well. Yeah, I was improving the website experience. She talked about yeah. looking in. It don't suck. So, um, and, yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was good. Uh, I think I got the replay link on them. I'm not sure I have to go look, but no, she's phenomenal. Honestly, I can't say enough cool stuff about Melissa. Just you know, very smart. Yeah. I'm watching her spread her wings. Yeah, and Stuart, if you want to know about you and your award-winning podcast, where do they want to go? Well, you can go to anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Stitcher, and search for Hotel Marketing. If your Hotel Marketing will show up number one. And uh, we've got a couple in the hopper that I haven't published. So it's been about two weeks since we published the last episode. So I need to get pull my finger out and get those. Up. But there's 169 that listened to that that are already published. So there's a good backlog. Get Let me know when you start allowing ads to show up so I can start buying ad space. On your never going to have ads. We're never ah. going to sell out. We have a lot of people approach us and want to sponsor the episode. I bet. I bet. Just, nope, not going to happen. It's ah. If I believe in your product, We'll promote it, right? Because it works. Right. Just like Flip2. We talk about Flip2 on the show all the time because it's a product that works. And Ed calls me all the time and goes, hey, I got another lead from someone listening to your podcast. So, yeah. yeah. Right. Word of mouth is the best form of advertising. Yep. Do things right. right. Say- product, you're going to go okay. <laughs> oh, by the way, Dell, I got to send you over a link to a platform we've been using and started using with one of our clients. It's coming out really well. It's called Video Peel, which allows people to do video testimonials. And yes. we didn't know how they react to it, but they're in their their post day letters, and also on our emails newsletters that we send out via the for okay. the client, and also on the signature lines of other the people that work at the hotel, and they're getting some really neat video testimonials uh, for the hotel. So, anyways, nice. um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, pretty cool. 
So with that in mind, thank you everyone that joined us tomorrow. Thank you so much. Uh, you're still there listening to us. And uh, we'll put all the little links to all the podcasts and everything else in the show notes since we did not use Robert's list. Sorry, Robert, we didn't have time for you to join the show today. We didn't have a list this week. <laughs> <laughs> we touched a little bit on hospitality and turkey and Thanksgiving and combination thereof. Uh, we hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving and have a wonderful weekend for all that. And a new holiday season that people can be happy with. Um, and until that end for this show, you can watch us on hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash live. Look for show number 277. And uh, the podcast number 277 will be going out today as well with a quick recap. So thank you, everybody. For Stuart, Adele, thank you very, very thank much. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks to you, Adele. Bye, everybody.